it's just a perfect morning in Tokyo. I don't know uh, where it is, uh, wh where all of you are and whether it is so wherever you happen to be, but um, yeah, crystal clear, light breeze, 21 degrees, life doesn't get much better than this. And then you have to zoom into me. So I'll try not to make it too tedious. Um, looking at the uh, participant rate here, I can see that uh, there's either plenty of people who haven't yet discovered it's a nice day because they're still asleep, okay, which is their prerogative, I guess, um, or they're just chilling, which is kind of understandable. Okay, um, so plenty of things to do today. Uh, just one thing I want to remind everyone on, and I'm actually going to write it in chat straight away, um, just uh, to reinforce the message, is I'm going to be assigning everyone to their groups uh, as soon as possible. And uh, I really want to know if anyone has commitments on the 10th, 16th, 17th of December that would make it difficult for them to be in the presentation session and therefore to, um, that might um, frustrate their uh, team members. It's not, it's not really about me. It's just all about the, uh, the fellow group members. Um, I'll say straight away, not everyone has to present and, and indeed sometimes it gets really clunky. And I've never run a presentation session on Zoom actually. So that's, that's a bit of a learning curve, but um, I have colleagues and friends who do this all the time in other universities. Um, in fact, I think a lot of people do it too often. Um, they kind of flip the classroom and let the students become the content. I'm, um, I've been doing the opposite so far this year, virtually. Uh, if anything, particularly my Zimmy say, I think have gotten off rather lightly. Uh, it's ended up being much more um, about me than about them in terms of the, uh, the work of carrying the class. Uh, but we will have this session where each group will present. Uh, of course, you can uh, practice. Um, using Zoom yourselves, uh, which is actually a really good way to interact, of course, to uh, develop your presentation. Um, now, so that that's, you know, we, uh, we don't have to have everyone present, we want everyone involved. So as I'll write in chat, um, right, okay. Um, oh, it shouldn't have been a question mark per se. Uh, don't tell me in chat now. Um, because uh, although I save obviously the, uh, the text file, um, it gets messy. So as per my instructions, so just send me an email. In fact, the email that I've sent out uh, that, that, was, that was titled um, like group issues or something, um, just hit return and uh, reply to me there. And already a few people have done that. Um, it does seem to be, I, I don't know if it's all the same, <laughs> all the same internship program, but um, I've already heard from three people who've got issues on December the 16th with internships. So if that's highly likely or possible, if you're in the running for um, a competitive internship, do let me know, okay? Um, because it, it's just, it's quite easy for me to assign you to a group that would be on the 10th, for example, um, rather than the 16th uh, or the 17th, if there's a fair probability that you'll um, not be available. Okay, uh, another thing was with the quiz. My uh, apologies, when I set the quiz up, uh, there, was a, there was a glitch. Uh, I created all the questions in a text file and import them. Um, and uh, there was, there was a kind of a, a messy kind of thing with the way the data file was formatted and um, to uh, and shuffling them around. I, I won't bore you with the details, um, but two of the, uh, not the question itself, but uh, two of the answer, the CK, were wrongly specified. And uh, so any of you who checked your scores after the closing of the quiz, um, you would have gone through and uh, on two of the questions, one of the questions was about uh, the use of partnerships to organize business today. Uh, some people collect and quite a few people got it correct and were marked wrongly. And so my apologies if anyone looked at them, ha. Uh, uh, the correct answer was actually accountancy. Still many accounting firms are organized on a partnership basis. Um, once upon a time, insurance was quite commonly organized on that basis. Um, the textbook talks about that, but that was back in the uh, 18th century. Uh, these days, insurance is organized normally on a uh, either a regular corporate basis, uh, for-profit um, uh, stock company, if it's you know kind of a normal kabushiki geisha uh, in Japanese context, or it's organized as a collective. Okay, 
uh, a co-op basis. So we don't see it organized as a partnership. Um, anymore. That's extraordinarily rare. So that one was wrong. And also, uh, there's a kind of uh, slightly complicated question that effectively uh, had a had a um, wrongly specified double negative uh, answer as the correct answer. That was the one about the liberalization of uh, limited liability and the use of joint stock companies to organize businesses. Um, the key point there uh, was that uh, joint stock companies were generally uh, liberalized, permitted prior to limited liability. And uh, I'm going to say something about liability in a moment, how we're going to deliver that material because we didn't cover that last week. Um, limited liability was very controversial um, uh, because it was seen as socializing losses, quite understandably. You know, people start business, okay, the liability is limited, the business fails with bills uh, left unpaid. Uh, and as a consequence, people who should be paid by a company lose out, okay? Uh, this is my experience with the collapse of several airlines, um, actually the collapse of an insurance company as well too. Um, I had an insurance, a travel insurance policy, which I couldn't use and didn't get my money back. And um, I had uh, several plane tickets that I haven't been able to use because airlines co uh, collapsed uh, this year. Um, to add insult to injury, the Virgin Airlines case was I, I, I had shares in the company and and three plane tickets and um, lost a lot. Although um, uh, a large American um, investment fund, um, Bain, um, associated with um, Bain Consulting, but Bain Capital have um, effectively taken over Virgin and have given me some kind of credit, but I don't um, I don't know if it's ever going to be really usable. Uh, so normally I haven't quite lost uh, everything. So there was a general recognition historically that limited liability did impose costs on suppliers, on customers and whatnot. And there was a very intense debate um, amongst politicians, business leaders uh, and whatnot uh, about whether this was a good thing. And actually many established business leaders were opposed to limited liability. Uh, the, uh, the bigger um, long established companies that were generally more stable or more um, profitable and relatively responsible. They may have treated their employees badly, but <laughs> relatively responsible in terms of um, paying their suppliers and whatnot, were really worried that they would face competition from a lot of new startups that were irresponsible, that were run by, you know, what we would say in English, reprobates, a wonderful old word you probably haven't heard of, reprobates. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I just type it in. Anyway, um, and scoundrels, um, other great 19th century insult was you cad. Um, so, dodgy people, um, well, it's one of the best words in English, dodgy, uh, especially because it's like in Japanese. Uh, Doji manuke ikage mitena. So doji as in usankusai. So there was a real concern that uh, the bad businesses would displace the good businesses because bad businesses could um, effectively discount go cheaper because if they failed, they didn't care because they weren't going to um, pay back the uh, the monies they lost if the business failed. So that, that was the concern. Uh, there were countervailing concerns that were quite interesting. Uh, the textbook talks about it, and, may, and today it may be seen as quite surprising, but it was widely argued by people sympathetic to the poor, more liberal reformers and whatnot, liberal in this American social liberal sense, that um, limited liability would make it easier for poorer people to start businesses. Um, the idea that the uh, the tradesman, for example, the builder, the plumber, the butcher, uh, someone you know, who's working for someone else might feel confident to start their own business um, on a limited liability basis. Um, that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical in uh, hindsight. Of course, you need minimum working capital um, and whatnot. So we, we know these days that actually the best thing to do to, to help poor people um, is, that, is actually to provide um, microfinance and particularly sharing arrangements, capital arrangements and whatnot. And so Grameen Bank, for example, in Bangladesh uh, and some others seem to have been more important uh, than um, uh, limited liability uh, per se. 
So anyway, they were the, they were the sets of issues that were there, and the takeaway lesson was that the uh, the correct answer there was the uh, the answer that um, said what was least accurate, what was effectively false, was the assertion that limited liability was generally liberalised before the uh, joint stock company form was. Okay, now as as to liability issues in uh, general. Uh, covering in the course. Uh, this week, I, I, I want to proceed with the schedule as usual. I don't want to fall behind. So um, as you'll see, I've put up two sets of slides, uh, eight, um, this one, the firm and agency, and nine, corporate control events. We'll see how far we get with that. Um, and seven, the liability issues, I'm going to do a video on demand. Um, now, my apologies for my own videos not being up yet. Uh, I have shot lots of video. Um, it's just uh, so much work in editing it all, getting it sorted and um, uploading it to YouTube. And uh, the last week and a half have been kind of a, kind of a crazy confluence of events. And uh, so despite best efforts, um, it's just proving to be time consuming. My, my experience from the spring is that actually creating VOD video on demand content, um, um, my guess of the absolute minimum is it's five times the workload of preparing a regular lecture and delivering it on Zoom. Um, somewhere, somewhere between five to 10 times the time involved, five to eight. My, my, my rule of thumb is pretty much five to eight times uh, the uh, the time involved. Everything, first of all, you've got to script it, you've got to get out, you've got to shoot all the video, um, you just simply got to, you've got to edit it up um, and then uh, suffer the frustrations of Wasada Network um, trying to upload very large files to YouTube, which has a success rate of like 30 to 40 uh, percent and has me want to um, scream. Some of you may have discovered this if, you, if you're doing um, large syncs to the cloud that the download speeds are okay but the upload speeds are really really choked off and very often it just uh, uploads kind of um drop out um i'm actually this afternoon hoping to get over to the uh, computer office and ask if, if they can give me a special port number that i'm sure some of my dike science colleagues um uh, can get to lift the limits of uploads because um, you know, some scientists and engineers are sharing massive data files and I can't believe that they're doing them with the internet connections that um, ordinary people like um, both yourselves and me um, have because uh, the regular faculty have um, the, uh, the same network access that uh, you guys have. Okay, so first of all, we're going to talk about the firm and agency. This, this notion of agency is really, really important and uh, particularly we'll talk about principal agent theory. Now there's uh, a lot of work done in economics, especially in microeconomics in terms of principal agent theory. Um, this is where economics overlaps with law. And it's a big topic in uh, law scholarship has been for several decades in the United States. Not least of course, because uh, despite the image of the legal system as being so much associated with criminal law, um, the vast majority of lawyers and the vast majority of legal cases are actually um, effectively corporate cases, uh, sometimes individuals in conflict with uh, companies, um, you know, consumer law issues, but the, uh, the, uh, the larger part of it is uh, effectively one corporate entity suing another corporate entity over so, some things. And of course, that is the, the ugly truth of the legal profession is that's where the money is. Um, I have a, uh, an old university friend um, who does legal aid, criminal law, um, and works incredibly hard and is rather poorly paid and mutual friends who all went into corporate law, um, all said he was an absolute idiot, um, that he wouldn't have a good life if he did that. Um, and the uh, certainly the corporate lawyers made a lot of money, but the interesting thing is so many of the people I know doing corporate law have actually uh, gone on to do other things, partly because they can, because they made enough money, um, that actually the uh, the human dimension actually keeps people more engaged with the uh, the law. People have been, you know, fitted up by bad cops and a whole bunch of things that you, you can muster much more passion for that sometimes than uh, um, helping one company to shift uh, liability to another company. Um, but if you, uh, if you Google my name, you will come across my cousin who's a uh, boutique, uh, a partner in a boutique law firm out of London and uh, very successful um, lawyer and uh, 
really his specialization was insurance. And uh, that's one of those classic ones um, of where uh, you're really fighting about issues of liability, you know, how much liability did a company have to uh, somebody else? Um, and uh, how much did uh, either an individual or another organization contribute to uh, a set of negative events that uh, had a lot of costs arising? Um, my cousin's case, by the way, his uh, wife is um, the, uh, the most senior uh, female uh, barrister in the state of Queensland and uh, extraordinarily accomplished um, and a specialist in family law. So I'm sure my, uh, my cousin is extraordinarily well behaved <laughs> because uh, one of the top divorce lawyers um, in the state, uh, he is married to. So you, I'm, I'm sure you have to be a very fine role model of a spouse in those circumstances. Okay. Um, now let's turn to agency then. And before we do that, I just want everyone to put five in chat. Okay. And we generate an attendance uh, list here. Just checking chat there, right. Um, just for the attendance, a few people have put it in um, pr as a private message. I prefer if you don't do that uh, for the very simple reason that, uh, well, first of all, uh, there is no question of privacy in actually turning up in a Wasada class. Uh, you can't come to a regular class on campus. You know, we're dressed, you know, with uh, uh, like a uh, ninja. So, you know, like the mask of Zorro or something. Okay. Um, that's fine if, uh, thanks, thanks, Luke. You don't, you don't need to do it again. Um, now the, uh, the main reason is just simply that um, the messages to all don't show up as a count in the chat, uh, whereas private messages do show up. So particularly when I'm in the um, desk share or screen share mode, um, if I get a, uh, a new chat lighting up, I, I would need to check that just to see in case someone's telling me that, you know, that the sounds collapsed or, or something like that. So that kind of rings alarm bells um, when the messages come privately. Okay, so the firm and agency. Uh, of course, when people hear uh, agency, they very often think of like a, a gym show in the sense of a talent agency. And uh, that is uh, quite a relevant uh, uh, aspect here. Remember that anything, whether it's a uh, what we, we, we call a travel agency or a real estate agency or, or whatnot, this is effectively someone working on behalf of someone else, you know, daihyo toshite hataraiteru. And uh, the reason why we tend to see those issues conflated in the English language is because uh, the fundamental issue of people working on your behalf is at the heart of agency. So we have the principal and we have the agent. The agent works on behalf of the principal. And when we look around, we'll see, once we become familiar with this construct of the world, you will see principal agent relationships everywhere. And it, it is quite an empowering notion. It, it is a way of reminding us uh, that the person who pays is the, uh, the principal uh, and the other party is the agent. Now, under some circumstances, the agent is more powerful than the principal, but that actually raises a whole range of ethical um, and regulatory uh, legal issues, okay? Uh, sometimes it's not clear cut, you know, who's working for who. Uh, and uh, that's, that's where it gets particularly interesting. Uh, when, when one has this perspective, uh, it's like, you work for me, no, you work for me, okay. Um, when you think about it, it is, it is pretty clear cut uh, who should be working for who, uh, but we sometimes forget this and we let our guard down and people can take advantage of us. Very simple example. If you go to rent an apartment, uh, it's absolutely, and you go to a real estate agent, Futosan, it's very clear that the real estate agent is the agent of the owner of the property because they're going to be paid by them 
uh, uh, you would think, okay? But hang on, aren't you paying for the service yourself directly, okay? Uh, the introductory fee. This is where it actually gets really, really fuzzy. Uh, in the case of a real estate agent, say in my country in Australia or the UK, which is selling a property, the agent is clearly working on behalf of the vendor. Uh, they are paid a commission based on the sale from the owner of the property um, who, is, who is selling it. Now in the uh, rental market as well, that's exactly how it works in Australia or the, or the UK too, that the uh, owner of the property uh, effectively pays uh, sometimes a, a once-off charge, very often say the just the first week's rent, for example, or two weeks rent, um, and then an ongoing percentage, typically 10 to 15% of the uh, uh, rental uh, month, week by week or month by month. And so the, uh, the agency relationship is very clear. The real estate agent that introduces the tenant, the person who rents the apartment, um, is the agent of the owner. And if ever you have an issue, you, you call them directly. But in Japan, it works quite differently. Real estate agents is, uh, are literally uh, facilitators. They bring two parties together. And uh, this is where it gets kind of complicated because in fact, what's happening is the renter pays what typically one month's rent, which uh, upfront is quite a substantial fee uh, for the services of being introduced to the property. So the uh, real estate agent uh, should be acting in, on your behalf um, in dealing with the landlord or your son, okay? Because you are paying the real estate agent. So that, that clearly makes the principal agent relationship where you're the principal and the real estate agent is the agent. However, the agent is, is in a conflicted position because they live by one of two things. They win by either um, getting new property listings directly. So having good relationships with real estate companies or individual owners of apartments and then listing that property for rental directly. Um, or, and it's really complicated, but effectively um, after a certain number of days, they can um, access a public database and advertise properties which are listed by another real estate agent. And then they share uh, the um commission for introducing someone to it. So it opens up a whole range of gray areas. Uh, but the really important thing is if it's a rental property in Japan, uh, don't hesitate to really push on the real estate agent themselves, okay? Uh, they often see themselves as a kind of a gatekeeper, but really you're paying, so they should work for you. Don't hesitate to, real, to tell a real estate agent, look, I'm interested in the place, but I think it's too expensive. Go back to landlord, for example, and say, reiki ni kagetsu ya. Ikagetsu nara, ano, onegaishite. Uh, they uh, will often give the sense of, ya, sorry, sorry, wa dame desu yo. It's like, ma, tori aizu kite kudasai. So you might as well ask. And um, you can play kind of hardball. Make them earn their money, okay? This is something... Um, that you almost should have tattoo on you. Make them earn their money. Now, if you buy a property in Japan, this is where it gets incredibly messy because a real estate agent, uh, assuming they have the listing, so they directly have dealt with the, uh, the vendor, the real estate agent gets a commission from both parties. Um, in some countries, it's absolutely illegal. Uh, so they, there's a several, a several percent commission paid um, from both sides of the transaction. But out of bad habit after World War II, when uh, it was a booming market, uh, both, of, both sides of the commission are actually paid by the buyer. So if you buy real estate in Japan, you can end up being hit something like five to 6% in terms of real estate agent fees. So the um, commission construction and the agency relationships are just absolutely horrible. Uh, again, one of the implications here is if you are going to be buying a property in Japan and you're doing with a real estate agent, get very, be very polite, very respectful, um, but get very tough on them because you really have to make them work for their, for their money.
and is actually scoped to negotiate that with some real estate agents will drop one side of the commission, which can save you seven, several percent on a real estate deal is a huge amount of money. And uh, you would think that something so elementary as selling real estate would be standardized across the world, but it's not. The United States, it's very common to use a buyer's agent. So when you want to buy a property, you actually pay an agent to negotiate on your behalf. And they're very experienced in doing this and they will find properties for you. They will negotiate. Uh, they can save you a lot of money. So the US model or the, say the Australian or the British model where the, uh, the seller just pays the commission, uh, both of them tend to, to deal with the agency issues fairly well, as long as you know in the Australia, the UK case that the agent is completely working for the seller. They're not working for you. Um, even if they give you a bunch of flowers when you move into the uh, place you've just paid too much money for, um, they uh, still never let you forget. Uh, you, you should never let yourself forget that uh, they're being paid by the seller. The Japanese case, really, really, really messy. Anyway, before we talk about agency in general, uh, and precisely from a theoretical perspective, uh, we need to step back and actually talk about some more fundamental views about the very nature of the company. Uh, because in a sense, before you can talk about how you deal with the issues of making sure that the agents work for the principals, the people who... Uh, um, own the firm or have the stake in the firm, we have to decide is that, you know, who, whose entity is this? Okay. Um, somewhere in my shelf, I can, I can pull it out, but I won't bother now. I have one of the stupidest books I have ever bought. Um, the title of the book uh, is published about 10 years ago. The title of the book is, I know, Kaisha wa Kabunushi no Mono Dewa Nai. And I'm a hot. Okay, uh, that's just not true in Japanese law. Um, it uh, may be true in some people's imagination, but it's not true in Japanese corporations law. Uh, very clearly, the shareholders do own the company. Uh, but the broader point of the book was that um, takeovers were kind of bad and that other stakeholders in the firm should be valued as equally as shareholders. And it, there's a complex set of issues. It, the book wasn't completely wrong uh, in terms of uh, certain uh, facts and figures and, and secondary aspects, but the totality of the view was quite wrong. Uh, we'll see that in the Japanese case, you can mount an argument that at least some employees have uh, the status of, in practice, not necessarily in law, residual claimants in some sense like shareholders, and particularly through things like uh, uh, deferred compensation. So Taishokin, uh, retirement bonuses and whatnot, uh, that uh, they have a longer term interest in the firm beyond their immediate compensation. That in itself does not actually undermine the basic notion that the firm um, is the property of the shareholders. But we'll talk further about this. So uh, we can see diverse views of the nature of the company and its, and its relationship to society and who it should be governed on behalf of across many different places. Uh, but we can roughly categorize them into two basic views. One is the shareholder sovereignty, okay? Uh, sovereignty just simply being like, like the king and the domain, uh, the queen and the domain in a similar kind of way. You know, whose property is this? Uh, who, who owns this and who has authority over it? So the shareholder sovereignty view should be that the overriding objective of management is to maximize shareholder value, that the shareholders are the owners of the company. And as with uh, any asset, uh, the owners get to decide uh, what happens with it. Now, we do have a range of qualifications in law. So it's not even true that if someone uh, automatically, that just because someone owns something, they have the right to destroy it, for example. Uh, we have heritage laws, for example, in quite a few societies now that says if you buy a building that's heritage protected or a work of art or something like that, uh, because this has uh, brought a cultural historical value to community at large, although you own it, you don't have an absolute freedom to do whatever you, you want with it. Um, so they are effectively arguments that uh, ownership gives you certain rights, but constrained rights that other people's are stakeholders too. And so things like taking uh, precious artworks out of the country um, 
they are very much banned in some countries and some people get themselves and tourists get themselves in trouble with this. In fact, there was even a uh, Japanese violinist who got himself trouble in Germany because he had a very uh, uh, historically kind of significant, uh, I think it was a violin or was it a cello? Anyway, it was a, it was a musical instrument um, and uh, was trying to leave Germany and it was uh, taken off him because he was uh, effectively uh, accused of smuggling cultural heritage. Uh, my understanding there, I might be wrong, but I, I had the impression that he uh, hadn't done the right paperwork to allow the, uh, the thing to actually leave the country. So we do see plenty of circumstances where there are constraints. Uh, if you buy a heritage listed apartment in a city like Copenhagen, for example, there are very strict limits um, as to what you can actually do with it. You certainly can't knock it down and replace it. Uh, you have even restrictions uh, about the uh, the appearance, the color of what you can paint, uh, paint it, and whatnot, and indeed local local governments in many places issue even style books. The, this is the only color palette that you can use for the thing that you own. And there have been lots of notorious cases of people challenging this. There's a guy who uh, has repeatedly uh, demanded his right to be able to paint his 18th century townhouse in central London um, pink polka dots or red and white polka dots or something. A bit, Yayoi um, summer isk and uh, the legal cases effectively have given him a degree of freedom, but not as much freedom as he as he wanted. So the shareholder sovereignty view says that okay, if you buy the company, if you have the shares, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, the counter view to this is that there are other people dependent on the firm. The stakeholder view of the firm takes a broader view of whose interest should be considered in the management of the firm's resources. That yes, you own the company, um, but you can't do what you want. Uh, just what you want with it. You can't just shut it down in a fit of peak, uh, fit of frustration, uh, because people's livelihoods depend on it. People uh, depend on the, uh, the services provided uh, by the product as by, by the firm as well. Uh, some of you may have seen there's a video going very viral at the moment, very deliberately. It was all designed to do this as some um, Russian uh, YouTuber um, uh, set fire to his uh, about Three hundred thousand uh, dollar US um, Mercedes sports car um, in a field a few days ago, and he's already got ten million views or something. Apparently, he kept having an argument with Mercedes Benz, so he burned his car. Um, but it seems to have been a uh, primarily a personal kind of branding ploy. Um, it is pretty confronting to uh, to see the image of of something, even though I I think the car's a bit tacky. Um, it well, the matte color's not bad. It's, it's not entirely tacky, uh, but to see it actually being um, scorched is is really quite confronting. Ai Weiwei, a very famous Chinese um, artist and quasi dissident, one of his artworks involved um, uh, a video video of him dropping uh, uh, ancient Chinese pots, hundreds of years old Chinese pot, and uh, smashing it. And uh, that was seen, seen as very confronting, but his broader point was that this happened routinely with the breaking of um, ancient, very, very old, you know, ancient neighborhoods in Chinese cities uh, for rash new developments. And his point was that the, uh, the communist government uh, routinely kind of smashed elements of Chinese culture, but when he drops one vase, um, it's considered as an act of violence against uh, cultural heritage. So playing with these sets of issues and rights uh, about, you know, it's my culture, I'll smash it if I want to kind of thing. So many of the theoretical differences and the po practical political differences center around these two different views, the shareholder sovereignty view or the stakeholder view of the firm. Um, now, the first thing I want to say is we must take very seriously the shareholder view. A lot of people automatically just reject it. They hear this is neoliberalism or this is just, you know, uh, American uh, fund managers, self-interest talking. But there is a very powerful uh, logical argument for the shareholder view. We'll also see that there are qualifications to it, that there are some um, ways to argue against this view um, on its own terms. And that's the really important thing, that if you just simply say, ah, oh, but pe you know, people's livelihoods develop on the, uh, depend on the company, uh, therefore the shareholder view is nonsense, then you're just not out the gate. Uh, you just will have no credibility uh, talking to any economist because overwhelmingly economists take this seriously, but uh, they also take very seriously qualified uh, versions of this. Now, you've already seen this quote as part of a larger quote that we had right at the beginning, and I'm going to read it out again and emphasize the uh, P 
the part of it which relates directly to the shareholder view of capitalism. So the public corporation is the nexus for a complex set of voluntary contracts, the sort of nexus of contracts amongst customers, workers, managers, and the suppliers of materials, capital, and risk bearing. Lots of people bring things to the to the company. Um, they do so voluntarily because it's in, in their interest. People who, who go and you know, do an internship in a company are doing so voluntarily um, in return for an experience, sometimes a paid internship, very often just an experience. Um, my view is probably more internships should be, uh, should be paid uh, or shouldn't be called internships um, or should have a much more uh, of a learning component, but that's a separate issue. Uh, the critical thing is that people voluntarily choose to do this. Okay. Similarly, people who supply any anything, whether it's materials, you know, a, a bent or to a meeting, uh, anything, copy paper, whatever they they provide, uh, electricity, all of those things uh, to an organisation. Capital, uh, bankers who lend loans, people who buy bonds, uh, corporate bonds, for example, uh, and um, shareholders are a separate case, and we'll talk about that. But in this in this description, shareholders can be thought of this as well too. Um, and risk bearing, but this is the critical thing. The distinction between the capital and the risk bearing, how do we sort this in our mind? What Michael Jensen's saying here is that um, capital is when it doesn't bear uh, risk as part of the transaction uh, explicitly um, as a risk sharing thing, we're talking about people who buy bonds and people who lend loan, who give loans to a company. So that's banks who give loans to a company. That's typically capital. Okay. And then the risk bearing are those who are the shareholders. Now we'll see, of course, the reality is if the company fails that everyone has an element of risk bearing um, when they fit into all of these categories. So this is where it becomes gray. Um, but anyway, this is the, uh, the critical uh, notion that there's contracts here and lots of people supplying things to the company. So corporations, like all, all organizations, vest control rights in the constituency, so the party or the, the, the person or the organization, okay, bearing the residual risk, uh, which is the risk associated with the difference between the random cash inflows and outflows of the organization. So cash inflows just means all the money you earn and all the outflows, uh, all the costs, paying for all of those other inputs, okay? So what effectively is this saying in Michael Jensen's terms and in the shareholder view, um, all of those people, the customers, the workers, the managers, the suppliers of everything, um, and including loans and bonds are what's referred to by economists as fully contracted or fully compensated for what they provide to the firm, okay? So I come to Waseda University and uh, I work for Waseda, commit to Waseda and to Waseda's stakeholders. And uh, as an employee of Waseda, I have a responsibility to all the stakeholders. Um, and uh, in return, uh, Waseda agrees to provide certain benefits to me and obviously to provide me a salary. And that's it, I've agreed to that. And I have no extra claims upon Waseda beyond what is specified in the employment contract. Now, the important thing to note is I've never signed a contract with Waseda other than when I first started, okay? I don't have an annual contract. Um, it's not a rolling contract. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure that I even, I'm not sure I signed anything. Um, you guys did. Uh, students don't really, really often forget this, but all of you did sign a contract. Um, uh, which agree where you agreed to be a, a good representative of Waseda, you agreed actually to show a student card if ever you're asked. Um, so if ever a professor asks you because you're mucking around in class to show your student card, you're actually obligated to, things like that. Uh, a lot of people don't pay attention to it when they sign it. Um, it's just in the first fever of becoming a university student. Yeah, yeah, whatever, tick the box, okay. Um, do what you must, Um I can't even remember if I signed something. But the, uh, the critical thing is that the, in the Nike, the internal rules of Waseda, um, it specifies that the salary and benefits will be decided from time to time um, by Waseda. And the legal position is quite clear that uh, every day I choose not to resign from Waseda and every day I do something which um, is 
understood in law and theory as what we call implicit contracting. So every day where I actually, for example, just if I reply to a student email, um, that can become proof uh, in law in a court that I still considered myself in an employment relationship with Waseda. I come into my office, okay? The very fact of coming onto the campus, coming into my office, opening the door, starting Zoom, for me is an implicit contracting. And I, if I simply tried to deny um, that I currently thought of myself as a Waseda employee, they'd only have, they'd have my Zoom records, uh, they'd have the, uh, the record of me coming up in the lift and what not to be able to say, you know, all of these things, you were reaffirming your contractual relationship with uh, Waseda, okay? Uh, so when you, when you want to deny that you're in, a relation, in, in any kind of ongoing relationship with an organization or an individual, uh, actually there's a whole lot of evidence that can, that, uh, can be used against you. And uh, be careful of this. In many countries, for example, just um, moving in with your girlfriend or boyfriend um, can put yourself in a situation of effectively being understood to be in what we call um, in a de facto relationship. Okay, a de facto. So de facto is, um, it's like in Japanese, jitsukon. So the jitsu is de facto. Um, it is in, in the fact of, in the reality of day to day. So it's quite possible, for example, in the Australian case to sponsor someone for a spouse visa, even if you're not actually legally married, um, if you can demonstrate that uh, you have lived as a couple like Jitscon, um, so you can actually get a visa for someone, uh, for your partner, just by simply demonstrating the truth of this. So this is both in theory and law. So it doesn't mean that you've necessarily signed up every single day and therefore contracting. It's just the very act of doing things. So if you're a florist and you uh, deliver flowers to a restaurant twice a week, uh, you are in a, it's understood to be in a voluntary contract as a supplier. Uh, you don't need to have that, the, uh, the contract in advance. Now that, <sighs> affirmation of the contractual relationship between the two of you, what then that obligates you to do, this then is, is discussed in theoretically in terms of bargaining in the shadow of the law. So the assumption is that uh, parties know their mutual obligations as specified in law and the act of, of maintaining a relationship um, obligates you to act in a certain kind of way. So it's not necessary that to ever sign a piece of paper uh, affirming certain terms and conditions. So there are lots of what we call Australia bush lawyers. I remember being told by my grade five teacher that I was being a big bush lawyer. I guess the, cl the closest expression in English is like Hedy Kutzer, being a smart ass. The teacher didn't call me a smart ass, um, but I was. But most people who become academics are smart asses. Um, but yeah, I remember him uh, quite explicitly telling me, don't be a smart ass. Um, ignorance is no defense in law. So a lot of people get themselves in trouble. Uh, they start dealing with somebody or providing a service or living with someone. And effectively what they've done is they've voluntarily um, contracted with the, with, uh, the other party uh, subject to the terms that kind of commonly in the Jorsky sense uh, apply in a particular domain. So uh, that's why a, lo a lot of people immediately reject the shareholder view when they hear these expressions of it. But actually the truth is this, is this is the reality in law. So this issue of residual risk is the really big one in terms of explaining the shareholder view. Corporations like all organizations best control rights in the constituency bearing the residual risk, which is the risk associated with the difference between the random cash inflows and the outflows of the organization. Simply put, um, if at the end of the month, at the end of the year, uh, the company ends up with um, uh, a positive uh, stock of cash, positive cash flow. So it's got money in the bank after it's paid everyone it should pay, after it's received from money from everyone who should pay money to it, okay? Uh, if the business ends up with cash, who owns the cash? Who gets, who has a claim on the cash, okay? Similarly, uh, if the company uh, runs a loss, 
uh, the business fails, who is responsible for the loss, okay? So who picks up the, uh, the rewards and who bears the ultimate risk? And this is an inescapable logic. Uh, and that's why you'll find that economists, um, particularly influenced by Michael Jensen, who's a real pioneer, he's an academic, but uh, you know, a real pioneer of the theory of the firm. They are relentless in arguing this. Um, because they will say it's just an inescapable logic that uh, if any business, any corporation goes well and makes money, um, whose money is it? Okay. But of course, trade unions come back and say, well, we've all, we've all contributed to the success of this business. But you can see that these are the kinds of issues that arise all the time, um, but become very heated. So for example, um, as a former student of mine did when he, he did an internship at a, uh, at a company and it was a paid internship and he was paid a thousand yen an hour, uh, which is it's a reasonable thing for a paid internship. He was learning. Then they kept him on doing baito um, and they kept paying him a thousand yen an hour, um, but they were no longer teaching him very thing, uh, things. And indeed uh, they were telling him to come in in a suit and that he was effectively working for clients. And on one occasion, he had to go down to, I think it was Nagoya uh, for a client meeting as the representative of the company. And he was the only person who went there. It was obviously, as, as the son didn't say, they, they had great trust in him. So he had to put his suit on, ironed his shirt, went down there. And uh, they, uh, the company was quite lazy. Uh, they said, oh, well, seeing you're going down there, take the invoice for last month's billing for what we're doing. Um, so he had an envelope, how much you were charging? And of course he looked at it and he suddenly realized that um, he was being billed to the client at about Ichimango Sen in an hour and he was being paid Sen in an hour, okay? And so you immediately think, hang on, hang on, hang on. They're paying me a thousand yen and they're earning uh, you know, uh, 15,000 yen an hour off the client for me, okay? But it's not just him. It is, it is the company. Uh, it is the, tr the trust associated with the company. So then it gets into very complicated issues about, well, how much should I be fairly paid? It's quite clear in law that he agreed to work for a thousand yen an hour and the client agreed to pay 15,000 yen an hour. And if uh, they pay 15,000 yen an hour to be serviced by the uh, third year university student, um, recent ex-intern, uh, they're, they're mugs, but okay, that's uh, kind of how the corporate rates go. Now in practical terms, and the lawyer's view would be, okay, well, uh, what that guy, if he's not happy getting a thousand yen an hour, he can simply uh, threaten to quit, demand that he gets a larger share of the work. Um, and then the company decide, can they find someone else um, to pass off um, as a consultant uh, paying him a thousand yen or an hour or not. So it just simply comes down to market transactions. And that, that, that's quite a logic. And in practice, this is um, overwhelmingly um, what uh, prevails. Uh, these issues are one reason why you see so much instability in certain industries, um, particularly in uh, services firms such as consulting, uh, branding consulting and whatnot, where so much of the know-how rests in people's head. There's actually very little in terms of the system of a company. This is vastly different in manufacturing, of course, because a significant part of the costs of any manufacturing, of, of, of making things, uh, the capital equipment, you know, the machines and the embodied technology and the systems and proprietary knowledge. Uh, but in knowledge-based industries, this is often not the case. Um, and so effectively, you can see some very intense uh, fights about uh, who gets paid what and how much people should be compensated. Uh, this is a very big issue right now in companies such as Deloitte, which is organized on a partnership basis. And we've seen um, in the Australian case, it's all over the, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald and the Australian Financial Review, that um, people were actually having their salaries cut back, bonuses, bonuses cut back and whatnot. But it turned out that uh, Deloitte was doing very well um, despite Corona. And so there's a very strong perception that the partners who are the residual claimants uh, were still getting paid. Uh, in fact, were, were getting paid even more while the other employees who were contributing so much and they say the consulting business uh, were actually having uh, their share of the benefits uh, cut back. 
So, well, of course, it ends up in the newspapers. You, you, you know, you've got kind of reputational problems and clients start to ask themselves, why are they paying so much? Okay, now, when we think about stakeholders, this is absolutely critical because this is the counter view. So who are the stakeholders? Now, the first thing to say is that you can recognize these stakeholders without necessarily rejecting the shareholder view. And we'll see in a moment how that actually works. But stakeholders, employees, providers of credit, suppliers, customers, local communities, environment groups, government, um, on behalf of, of the community and uh, society at large in relation to say cultural heritage. Okay, so a very influential report on corporate governance back in 1998 in the UK said directors as a board are responsible for relation, relations with stakeholders, but they're accountable to shareholders. So the shareholders own the firm, but uh, the board are responsible for relations with stakeholders. And this gives us a hint about how you can reconcile the two, that shareholders' interests are, can, are well served as the owners of the business by caring well for all of these other um, stakeholders. So in the example I mentioned before, you know, the owners of that consulting and market research firm that were paying the student only thousand yen an hour while selling them the guy to clients much more, um, they're not acting very much in the interests of shareholders if they don't manage the perception that that's unfair. So first of all, um, you basic cynical business practice, uh, the uh, person who's being um, obviously underpaid relative to what the clients are paid, you never get them, you, ne you never show them the invoice, you don't show them what the client is paying, but eventually they will find out. And uh, this is actually why so many people go on freelance, they leave and they take the best clients and then they try, companies try and um, wrap their employees in legal contracts uh, to stop those kind of things. But the perception issues are a problem. So the broader argument with co corporate social responsibility, CSR, is that CSR, um, is something that management should take very seriously because it's good for shareholders. So you can actually get hold to a shareholder uh, sovereignty view and be very pro CSR as well. It's an empirical question. Do, does looking after these stakeholders best serve shareholders' interests? The, share, the stakeholder view of capitalism says that even if it doesn't, uh, these stakeholders should be looked after, that they equally contribute to the value of corporations. Now, recently, a lot of companies have been talking the language of stakeholder capitalism. And uh, do they really believe it or not? Or are they a little bit uh, kind of cynically reading the uh, mood in terms of concerns about inequality? I suspect that there's a degree of cynicism there uh, more than anything else. Now, Jensen rejects the stakeholder view and he does so, I think, for a very powerful reason. Uh, that we do need to take into mind. He says, for control to resist, uh, to rest in any group, any other group other than the shareholders, um, would be equivalent to allowing the group to play poker with someone else's money. The implicit denial of this basic proposition is the fallacy behind the so-called, if you really want to just slag something off, just say the so-called stakeholder theory of the, of the corporation. Corporation. According to this theory, the directors and managers of the corporation are to run it in the interests of all stakeholders, not just the residual claimants. Okay. Um, so the, this view says that um, the shareholder sovereignty view criticizes the stakeholder view for not providing a principle to guide managers' decision when there is a conflict of interest between stakeholders. And this is a really fundamental point. Um, we need a decision rule. If it comes down to a conflict between shareholder interest and employee interest, who do you favor? Okay, when it's unambiguously interest in, in the interests of the owners of the business to fire someone, for example, who's not working well, um, do you fire that person? Because you have an obligation to the owners of the business that is larger than an obligation, in a sense, to provide a, uh, an income to someone regardless of their performance. Now, lots of surveys have been done of people where people in general uh, reject shareholder, the shareholder view. But then when you, when you get down to particular cases, you realize that people's views are actually much more nuanced, um, where you, you present a scenario of someone who's really lazy, doesn't properly contribute, do they deserve to be uh, fired? Yeah, okay, a lot of people will agree with that. Um, so in practice, we see that there is some recognition that um, 
at very least it's a qualified stakeholder position that recognizes that um, you do have an overriding obligation to the owners of the business. So in a shareholder sovereignty view, management would consider the um, interests of other stakeholders when is in the interest of the shareholders to do so. So does this actually make the company more valuable by treating its employees well, okay? And um, this seems to be a very minimalist position that sort of diverges on immorality, but coupled with uh, a view that the government should really proactively regulate business so that the government should create lots of rules that require a company to protect the environment, to look after employees, to do all of these good things, then, breaking those rules, not complying with those rules would be not in the interests of shareholders. So the shareholder capitalism view together with a view of a very active state, which regulates business for social and environmental goods makes sense. And this is um, many economists view. It's the role of government to set the boundaries in which uh, businesses act. And within those boundaries, then business should be focused on making um, a profit. And particularly this is the Chicago, Chicago School and um, people like um, Friedman, Milton Friedman, uh, very much a liberal, uh, very famous economic liberal, very critical, uh, but much criticized and little understood, uh, um, but much criticized despite being little understood. His, his argument is it's, it's, the, it's the role of government to set, set um, norms and standards, ethics, rules. It's the role of business to make a profit uh, within those rules that are set by government. Okay, so let politics be politics and let business be business. And he sees a distinction between uh, the two. Uh, it actually gets really gray in a lot of places because what we've seen is that very often governments um, have not regulated vast areas of the economy because once upon a time they were actually providing the business themselves. So politics became local. So telecommunications, for example, was typically an extension of the post office. Uh, so many places it used to be Ministry of Post and Telecommunications, MPT, for example. And so there were just weren't rules um, because the, the government directly did it. Uh, once it's privatized, you have to have more rules. And this is a fundamental point that actually privatization brings more regulation, not less for these very reasons. So anyway, the managers are the agents serving the shareholders who are the principals. This is the critical view in the shareholder view. So we need to understand agency theory. Um, let me have a swig of water. So it directly relates to the shareholder sovereignty view of the firm, but it's not exclusively limited to it. We've seen a lot of domains. Um, it notes the separation of ownership and management in the modern enterprises, okay? Um, and it looks at the principal agent problem. And it focuses in particular on what we call agency slack. Um, agents may act, uh, seek to act in their own interests rather than the interests of the principals who are employed by them. Because the very reason why you hire someone else to do something is because either you don't know how to do it yourself, uh, there is information asymmetry, or you don't have time to do it yourself, okay? So you're getting someone else to do it. Both of those basic reasons for employing someone else to do something makes you vulnerable. Uh, you are very vulnerable to a quack doctor, a doctor who gives you um, wrong advice or lazy advice. And I have had several dear friends um, who have been very poorly served at certain critical points by doctors who didn't take seriously their symptoms. Um, uh, one dear colleague and friend is dead as a consequence because the doctor kept telling him, you're okay, until a test showed that he wasn't, that he had a massive brain tumor um, and uh, unfortunately died far too young. So uh, there's a whole lot of interesting things about why actually people don't get a second opinion. Typically people don't get a second opinion when doctors tell you you're all right. Uh, the funny thing is the doctor tells you you've got three months to live. People get a second opinion because they don't like the result. Um, people say, you're fine, don't worry about it. People don't get a, get a uh, second opinion, but actually the second opinion in the first case is more important than the, <laughs> the, uh, the situation where they're told that you're gonna die uh, in many respects. So um, agency slack arises owing to basic difficulties in monitoring and controlling uh, the agent, fundamentally information asymmetry. Uh, the worst kind of boss is someone who hires someone to do something um, and then just doesn't let them get on with it. But you can understand why people fall into that trap 
uh, because they're really anxious that it's being done properly. So there's always kind of ho you know hovering, looking over over someone's uh, shoulder uh, is bad practice, uh, but uh, understandable. So you have to get the original hire right, and then we'll see you have to get the incentives right to make sure the person acts um, in your interests. So there's lots of other principal agent relationships. As, as we talk in these terms, it becomes very obvious, okay? So the directors nominated by the major shareholders in the company are also in a principal agent relationship. And this is a problem, you know, someone's got, you know, 20% from 19% shares in a company, for example, uh, they propose someone to the board. Um, and then the person who they think should be acting in their interests, once they're on the board, actually, uh, they have a broader legal responsibility beyond the shareholders who push for them, by the way, they, that's uh, so they're right to do this. Uh, then they talking with the CEO and they develop a good relationship and then they may end up actually, actually acting not in the interests of um, the people who pushed them in the first place, uh, to be elected to the board. This is what always happens in representative democracy. You're elected from Niigata, um, lots of rice farmers vote for you, you go to Tokyo, and uh, then you're convinced uh, by some other people that would be in Japan's interest to liberalize uh, its rice market, okay, in return for other trade benefits. Um, and the locals think, you know, Uragimono, we betrayed you, you know, we kind of sent you, you know, we, we voted for you, sent you to Tokyo to argue to protect rice growers. Um, but as a member of the diet of the parliament, you feel that you have, and rightly do, you have broader responsibilities to the nation as a whole. So there are a lot of these questions of what, who is the principal, who is the agent, and what are the obligations that are actually very I my, very vague. Um, and uh, very often, uh, more imagined than real in terms of a legal situation. You know, one of one of the uh, the common expressions is, uh, "You work for me," or "Don't forget who you work for." Um, so when a politician takes very large donations, for example, which is really important for the election campaign, uh, the people making the donations may think that they're effectively buying the uh, the politician, okay? That this person is gonna work in our interests when they get into the parliament um, to to lobby for what we want to do. And so then the uh, the grumpy donor, when the politician doesn't do exactly what they say, is, hey, I thought, you know, that's, I, you know, I thought you worked for me um, and then the, the smart politician says, well, I, I have great regard for you, but I work for the nation as a whole. And then of course the donor will say, well, you needn't think you're getting any more money out of me again, okay? So a lot of these kind of situations center on um, the, the perceived symmetry or symmetry of an agency relationship. Um, once upon a time in law, it was very clear that kids were the agents of their parents. <laughs> uh, very clear, it's very clear the, the case in law now that it is not Okay, the employer employee relationship is a very clear principal agent relationship. The uh, Waseda University is the principal, I am the agent, absolutely. Um, but other supplier relations are not okay. Um, so, in, in, in complicated kinds of ways, I, I won't get into the detail now. But, but fundamentally, the firm supplier relationships are. So if you're buying new computer services, the uh, clearly the client um, is the um, is the principal uh, and the people providing those services are not. But if you have partnerships between institutions, um, it is not principal agent relationships. So we have an exchange agreement. Um, it is a meeting of two parties. So that's not a principal agent dynamic. It's two principals agreeing to collaborate. Um, it gets really, really complicated if we have a fee-based study abroad program, for example, um, where uh, students' parents or students themselves pay for study abroad, but Waseda has kind of brokered that and gives credit. Um, what are the relationships there? And that can get uh, tested in law. Okay, so agency slack. Um, what gives rise to it? Information asymmetry, okay. Uh, management has much more available to it than the uh, shareholders. So in the basic corporate governance problem, um, di very different risk profiles of the principals and the agents. And this is something we'll explore in various circumstances. It will become clearer uh, later on. 
So one of the underlying differences, for example, so I'll keep moving this around, sorry, is maximizing shareholder value by returning resources to them. Shareholders generally would prefer a profitable company to stick to what they're good at, um, return some of those profits to shareholders through dividends, okay? Uh, they really don't want the company hoarding cash or diversifying into other areas. Um, management employees would prefer to keep the money in the company rather than to give it to shareholders. This is the single largest source of conflict between institutional investors and companies that um, the investors want larger dividends. And Michael Jensen is also very famous for his expression, um, debt is discipline. That actually by being in debt, you're forced to um, keep your costs under control. That agency slack is less likely when you have um, difficult financial times, okay? When everyone is kind of fighting for survival. So agency slack is greatest when the company is actually doing quite well, okay? あの、so the big issue is about aligning incentives. Um, how do the shareholders, in this case, particularly with the separation of ownership and control, how do the shareholders get management to act um, in their interest? Uh, and in so many cases, you know, how, how, does, how does the company get its sales team to work hard? Um, one of my uh, dearest friends when I first came to Japan, um, he was an ego man for Nikko Shoken. Um, very tragically, he died about two years ago, um, terribly young. Um, Karoshi um, in London, but uh, he and I, um, I, I, I went to Nagoya um, precisely because he was there. We, I met him backpacking in Thailand and, um, and then I was offered a job. I went to see him in Nikko Shoken and I was in the Madison bookstore and I was offered a job literally um, uh, while waiting to, to meet Hiro and ended up working in the uh, the office next door to him. And uh, so we used to skive off, you know, <laughs> we'd go to Dotoru and uh, drink coffee and whatnot. And he would sometimes pretend to be visiting clients and in the days before smartphones and uh, apps we can track where employees are. Um, he would go to the movies and whatnot, um, but he was also a very good salesman. Had these good Kansai uh, talk. He was a great ego man, very charming. Um, and so he still filled his kind of quota. Um, but in the end, uh, he could slacken off during the day precisely because uh, there were some incentives for him to perform nonetheless, okay? You know, there were bonuses, there was prospects of promotion, and he was also very focused because his English was good on um, getting an opportunity to work abroad. And that's how he went to London in the end uh, with Nico Shokin um, because he really did deliver the goods, okay? So he could be a bit of a slacker. The company could be uh, quite trusting and not tracking where he was precisely because they had incentives for him to do well. This is why sales teams are often given bonus compensation, okay? And the great advantage here is that you don't have to micromanage your employees as a consequence, okay? If the incentives are aligned. And this is in something you often forget about with professors, that in terms of research, professors have quite a strong set of incentives to be active in research, quite regardless of the university, because, uh, and it's a reputational research, that you want to get a reputation as a good researcher um, nationally and internationally, uh, it presents you more interesting career opportunities. So the universities don't have to watch the professors in terms of research. Um, if the people actually value those kind of things, if they've given up more comes in the hands up, if they, if they don't care about a reputation as a researcher, they may slacken off. The teaching is the problem, okay? There are absolutely no incentives in Waseda to teach well, zero. In fact, and we'll see one of the fundamental problems in universities and particularly in Waseda and Japanese universities, um, and particularly in SILs, because we have no core courses, is that the incentive structure is actually to teach badly. Scary professors and boring professors 
get fewer students, therefore less work. Um, when I'm struggling to get, you know, hundreds of exam papers and sorts of on and everything all graded um, at the end of January, February for the grading deadline, it drives me crazy when I come in and so my colleagues have got very few students go, eh, mother, what did I know? I'm like, yeah, yeah well, uh, no, it gets quite uh, kind of nasty. Okay. So I know in universities, people do this. Professors, and not just Wasada, but lots of universities, professors go in and they're really, really, really unpleasant in week one in the ad drop period to try and scare as many students off as possible. Okay. Um, now, in most universities, they overcome this by having core courses, um, Hisukamoku. And all the professors have to teach a hisukamoku, so force march on the students of conscripts. But SILS is like uh, no, some kind of crazy families uh, biking, okay, where you can take whatever you want, um, and except for data, um, uh, statistics, and poor Hayakawa sensei managing that, uh, no, as a conscript army, uh, you're free to do what you want, free to avoid the things that are really uh, kind of not so interesting or, or badly from an educational point of view, the free to ignore the really serious things. So some of my most impressive colleagues don't get, don't get so many students because they're tougher than me. <laughs> okay, maybe I should harden up. Uh, but you can see that in terms of the designing of incentives, it can have a huge impact on people behave behaving. But one of the, uh, the key things we're gonna talk about um, over the next few weeks is actually what makes people do well, even when the incentives are poorly designed. Because uh, what we do see is that lots of people, despite poor incentives, still work hard. But focusing particularly on finance here, uh, the question is about how do you align the interests of residual claimants? So this is shareholders and management. So Jensen's focused on the active investors, those who have equity stakes, who take responsibility for supervising a company. And we'll talk further about this. So the typical way to do this is to get the management to act like shareholders. So stock options, performance pay, conditional deferred compensation, um, which is just simply a way of saying that um, you have share options and a strike price price um, so that if the uh, at a trigger price so if the share price rises to a certain level for long enough the uh, ceo and maybe other top management can uh, trigger share bonuses so they get big bonuses paid in terms of shares or cash cash payments if they hit some particular target and so the performance management um, tends to work like this. If you hit a target, you get some kind of bonus. It's trying to incentivize in good behavior. It's a big debate then, you know. Um, large executive compensation practices provoke criticism. You know, uh, do incentive structures lead management to sacrifice long-term growth of the firm for short-term returns? Um, if the, the, in the short term, you want to make the, the company look profitable, have the share price go up, Maybe you'll make it look profitable, cost cutting, reducing research and development, not investing in staff training, all of those kind of things that long term weaken the company. And so this is a, a powerful criticism. If the analysts are really doing the job, they will recognize this, that actually they're just sacrificing the future to make the present look good. And this is referred to often in uh, finance terms as a uh, window dressing, where you're making something look very good from the outside, but there's just kind of nothing behind it longer term. However, um, it's, uh, there is a shareholder capitalism response to this uh, perspective, which says that actually managers can gain in the job market through a reputation for enhancing shareholder value. Um, similarly, uh, Hollywood producers and particularly the directors, uh, they often want to, this is a classic um, agency problem. The director wants to make a great film which boosts their reputation as a director, even if uh, it costs a lot of money and the movie loses money, as long as the, uh, the, um, the movie looks great, then you, as an art director, you've got a great reputation. Um, on the other hand, you lose the investors or the studio a lot of money. But what we've seen is that those directors who have a track record of keeping costs under control 
as well as hitting targets in terms of popularity for a movie, um, find it easier to raise more money to do more movies. So, so Ridley Scott, uh, Christopher Nolan, both of them have uh, a reputation for doing very interesting movies that are actually finished on time and on budget. So on time and on budget. Now, we'll see many circumstances where this is not the case and, and not the norm. Um, in fact, the uh, French uh, architect Jean Nouvel, uh, who actually did the, uh, he did the original design for the Denser building, then they handed it to a Zinicon who kind of messed it up. But uh, um, Jean Nouvel very famously said, when the government's paying for a building, they, uh, they always want to, they, they want to pay too little, they want great architecture and pay too little. So the only way you get a government, a government uh, contract in Europe is to lie about what it's really going to cost. <laughs> so he is just absolutely notorious um, for understating the cost and having a cost overrun. But he says, ah, but people want good architecture. They don't want to pay for it. So it's okay. Um, I wouldn't hire the guy on principle <laughs> for that very reason. Uh, but we see a lot of citizens and takes hold. Uh, one thing we need to keep in mind is that not all shareholders are equal. Okay they don't necessarily have the same shared interests in the governance of the firm. There's a big difference between the passive portfolio investor, the small time investor who has a few shares, um, and then the uh, active investor, or should be investor, so it's got active investment um, in terms of control. And what we see is that those people who want to control the company, want to take it over, uh, there is a premium for control that we will, we will talk about. So, Passive investors just want to maximize returns to the shareholders through dividends and a higher share price. Um, active investors, you would think, normally would want to do this, um, but they may have other motivations. Excuse me. <coughs> Getting dry. Um, this beautiful weather is very drying. Um, unfortunately, that also means that viral load spreads so dramatically. So keep your masks on. Okay, so major shareholders, they may be prepared to sacrifice shareholder value in return for strategic benefits arising, arising from other business interests. Uh, a classic one from the media, uh, Rupert Murdoch uh, in Australia, uh, most famous for 20th Century Fox um, in the United States, and a lot of media interests in the UK and other places, but uh, he was Australian, he gave up his Australian citizenship. Um, to uh, US citizenship in order to create the Fox network. Um, he, <coughs> excuse me, tried to, he, 60% he, of daily newspaper circulation in Australia is controlled um, by his group, News, News Limited. They tried to take over the only supplier, the only manufacturer of newsprint, the actual newspaper, the paper that the newspaper is printed on. Um, there was a company that used to be jointly owned by three major newspaper companies so that they couldn't take advantage of each other. Um, and he tried to take it over and was actually stopped by government regulators from doing this because there was a concern that uh, if you control the supply of the paper that the newspapers are printed on, that you will sell it to your own newspapers more cheaply than you will sell it to your competitors. Um, and so this is why we have to have tough competition policy. It's um, often why we have antitrust policy, which actually stops takeovers in the first place to make sure that uh, a business is not, uh, that's in a strategic position, is not unfairly used to favor another, what we call downstream business, okay? Um, we may see that a firm takes a controlling equity stake in a rival business to monitor it or to restrict its growth. Uh, you know, there is an expression in finance, you know, to buy it, buy it to kill it. Um, and, You'd say, well, surely if you, they should take 100% and kill it, but um, it's much better to actually take 51% and kill it kind of slowly and uh, inflict the, uh, the gradual diminishment in value on 49% of other unsuspecting kind of shareholders, okay? So there's a lot of ethical issues relate here. Or a customer may take, uh, uh, so you, you, you may take, um, uh, shares in a business to secure orders. If you're a major importer of say manufactured goods, uh, you may take investments in the retailers who actually sell your product, okay? 
literally in your customers in order to pressure them to buy your product, to be a channel for distributing your product rather than others. Um, in the Hollywood case, this was notorious. Uh, the studios uh, directly owned large numbers of cinemas all over America and had partial stakes in many others. Um, and we're really locking up the distribution channels, so a vertical integrated system. Um, by the way, this was a, uh, copied in the Japanese case, and you see the Shochiku Wasada cin Cinema um, on Wasada Dori is a classic example of that. That was obviously a cinema that was directly owned by Shochiku Studios, and of course would show Shochiku movies, okay? Um, they also had a distribution business for foreign movies. Now in the US, they had the very famously the Paramount degrees, which uh, decrees, which actually broke up the studios and particularly stopped the studios from owning um, fully integrated uh, cinemas. So we this, see this kind of behavior all the time. Um, this third point here is what we often refer to as a related party transaction, where you kind of force the firm you've got a partial equity stake in to do preferential business with yourself. Um, this gets really complicated in the Japanese case with the Keiretsu, you know, that if Toy Toyota owns, say, 18% of your shares, it's difficult to ignore Toyota um, in terms of their demands upon you, in terms of the way you run your business. For example, if you're making some components and selling them to car manufacturers, uh, when the Toyota sales staff come, uh, procurement people, not sales staff, when the procurement staff come, uh, no, and say, oh, you got to cut your prices. By the way, we, uh, your largest shareholder, um, other than the founder, that's very difficult to have that conversation. So a lot of competition law focuses actually on equity stakes in businesses and um, these legal issues of, as a shareholder, whether you're actually putting pressure on the directors to act contrary to the firm's interest because there are other shareholders. If you completely own the business 100%, you can do whatever you like with it. You can integrate it into business yourself. But if while there are minor shareholders, these issues tend to arise. Another sets of issues, of course, um, managers and uh, who are also shareholders transfer resources to themselves through high salaries and benefits at the expense of other shareholders. This is a really complicated issue with partnerships, many startup firms. Um, so we've got some really basic issues of challenges to agency theory. Uh, and the critical one here is this criticism of the simple notion of management self-interest. Uh, it asks some really basic questions. You know, are managers just completely self-centered? You know, if you join a company as Shin at 21, 22 years old, uh, and you work in that company for 25 years, this is your community, this is your life, you know, when you become a top manager, uh, in whose interests are you going to act? Are you really going to be just selfishly focused on yourself? Or will you really have internalized um, and into your identity, uh, the overriding interests of the firm as a whole, and actually be quite prepared to sacrifice yourself for the interests of the organization? Um, I know just working here at uh, Wasada, I have some colleagues such as Higuchi Sensei, um, amazingly selfish, uh, 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 selfless, selfless. Oh, no. Well, no, that's not a Freudian slip. Oh, no. He now has for like eight years has been on Shikobu, oh, no. Nushitanto, no. Oh, no. admission, responsible for admissions. And it's a hellish job. And every time the Shikobu has changed, he's continued it. And uh, I'm just just astounded, but you know he he is really devoted to the organization. And anyone else, if if someone said who wants to take over from Higuchi Sensei, the corridor is empty. You can't find anywhere. Everyone just like, you know, uh, runs a ego ego to runs a mile. Uh, wants to get away from it. But he has this very strong sense of service and thank God for it. And we all take advantage of it. And it's like, see, on a go, she must. Okay. Uh, so you do see elements of selflessness. Okay. Hold the more in a second. Okay. So this notion of, value, of maximizing company value. And uh, one thing I can say very strikingly with Wasada, one of the joys of working at Wasada is that there are so many people who really want to give back to the university. It's quite easy to get 
very high level guest speakers who are Waseda graduates who want to come back. Um, but also not just necessarily Waseda graduates, that there is this certain thing about people whose careers have gone well, that they really want to help younger generations and share their knowledge. Um, by the way, uh, uh, something I've noticed over many years, um, when you get to work in companies and when you're looking around doing internships or just meeting people, um, you will find, I think, that rather older managers will be your friend, your mikata, be on your side much more readily than younger people. A uh, lot of junior managers, late 20s, early 30s, still don't have a lot of self-confidence. They tend to be more defensive. Older people, more successful um, in the sense of their career is more advanced. Uh, they don't see you as a rival. They don't see you as a threat. And they tend to be rather more generous. Um, particularly uh, as they've become parents themselves, uh, they tend to be more uh, sympathetic. Uh, the kindest people around in terms of sharing their wisdom and their connections and whatnot are the chow veteran, the really old folks who see you as like, Choto, ano, daini no mago mitena. okay, they you know, as, as the, uh, treat you almost like their grandkids, you know. Um, and if you get an opportunity to go to corporate events, industry events and whatnot, a lot of those cho you imagine, uh, the, the veterans who kind of know everybody, uh, you have a huge advantage as being a really young person and approaching them because they won't in any way see you as a threat. Okay. Um, I must say, and this is a bit of an honor gay, um, that Ichiban uh, Kamaru no no sotsugyoshite kaisho ni haite ni nen me, san nen me, chotto jishin ga sikte, cho cho shi no teru, e ano, sugoi taido shiteru. I sometimes say that I, I don't want to see some Waseda graduates for at least five years <laughs> because they kind of think that they figured out how the world works at large. They figured out a tiny little part of it. And as you get up um, higher, you realize that uh, there are so many different fields of knowledge. You realize just really what you uh, kind of don't know. Okay. And I think many of you who've experienced already in Sakura, Choto Zai Senpai, you realize that kind of effect. So as people get older in life, their preferences change, and we will talk about this in society as a whole. And I'm going to do a vlog, a, a vod very specifically on this. Um, that they arguably become more philosophical, more socially oriented, less materially oriented. And this is actually a challenge for societies in terms of losing their, their kind of hunger as a whole. Finally, a really critical set of issues is if you only see the world through agency slack, um, it's can actually encourage distrust and distrust is inherently uh, problematic. And this is where I want to finish up in the comments here and also set you a very, very small task because next week I want to do a, a bit of a breakout uh, so that we can get people to meet each other. Um, if, you are, if you feel that you are distrusted, then you'll intrinsic motivation, this is a key concept in the psychology of work, is likely to decline. Um, and uh, the, there's an old joke amongst men, for example, with really paranoid wives uh, who are always fearing that they're going to have a uaki, okay? Um, you know, if I'm going to be accused of the crime, I might as well do it, okay? Or even worse, if, if you know, if, if I have to do the time, I want to do the crime. There's absolutely nothing worse um, than uh, being treated like a cheat when you're not, okay? Uh, so the kind of paranoid, jealous type uh, almost guarantees that uh, what they most fear that someone cheats on them will because the very lack of trust in the beginning just becomes so psychologically kind of tiring. So that in a funny kind of way, companies that actually say, we trust you to be professional, are more likely to encourage in most people uh, a very responsible reaction, okay? Now, in a minority people, they think, hey, well, yari ho day, great, I'm completely free to be as bad, as selfish as I want. Uh, the vast majority of people, interestingly, don't do that. So your little bit of homework for next week is to think about those issues that are finished up in the slides there, and then we'll talk about it, and I'll, I'll send out a reminder note, is what makes you good? 
okay? In what circumstances are you good and other people are good? And under what circumstances do you think people are bad, okay? So think about this. Um, everyone can have something to say on this. This is one of those kind of safe ones there where, I, where sh everyone should have a view. And in the context of corona, it's particularly kind of interesting to think about this. Lots of societies um, that have quite hard attitudes in terms of authority, hard states. And as it turns out, um, liberal democratic societies in Europe, my country, Australia and others, um, have tended to distrust people. They think that most people can't do the right thing. Therefore, for example, in Melbourne, there's a $200 fine if you don't wear a mask when you go outside. Japan actually has, to a remarkable degree, considerable faith in voluntarism that most people are kooky or your meta type and uh, no, will kind of do the right thing, except for a small minority that won't. I actually, I'm going to do a short VOD about these issues as well, too, and that, that'll be um, uploaded in a couple of days. Um, so think about this. Under what conditions um, do people behave themselves? Because to conclude, there is an interesting thing that... Um, Generalized levels of trust in Japan are very low. This is surprising. Uh, if you ask Japanese in surveys and several large organizations, such as the Pew Research Institute, have done this, how much do you trust strangers? The fascinating thing is, on average, Americans trust strangers more than Japanese do. Despite all of the riots in the streets, people having guns, all this kind of stuff. Um, on average, Americans are more optimistic about other people than Japanese are, okay? Um, yet you would think, given those results, that therefore Japan would always be passing rules to make all those bad people behave well. Um, but it's, it's more nuanced than that, because there also seems to be this notion that I don't really trust people, but I do kind of trust most people to be shamed into reasonable behavior, okay? So that suggests that we need a rather more sophisticated model of what makes people behave responsibly than pure principal agent theory from economics. And this is really the heart of governance. You know, can people govern themselves or does the government have to govern everyone um, through strict regulation of their behavior? And that's really the kind of issues we're going to look at for the, uh, the rest of the uh, course in a whole range of subset, subset of instances. Do you trust family members to run the business uh, more than you trust non-family members, uh, for example? Okay, we'll leave it there. The, um, as with the liability, the corporate control events things, um, I'm going to VOD that, okay? Um, but I will will come back to some of those issues next week in very specifically about hostile takeovers because this is so politically uh, sensitive. Right, okay, uh, it is an exquisite day. So if you've got nothing to do, I suggest you uh, go out and savor it. Okay, I'll hang around for a bit if anyone's got issues that they um, want to uh, ask me about. And just a reminder, Make sure to message me if you are likely to be unavailable on the 10th or the 16th or the 17th of December. Um, let me know because I'm going to put you in your groups um, in advance of next week. And next week we have a drop-in session period four. Okay. Um, I had a wonderful chat with a um, small number, but very engaged number of people um, with the course. I uh, enjoyed it greatly. So come along bounce ideas around, talk about capitalism, whatever. But also, um, this will be a first opportunity to check your understanding about the task for the, uh, the group work, which I, I will also be releasing in advance of that. So use that opportunity. Um, but one final request on this, uh, you'll have quite detailed instructions. Um, I want to warn people, I'm a very relaxed guy. One of the few things that makes me very unrelaxed is when people just say, uh, can you just tell us again what we have to do? And it turns out that they haven't really read the instructions properly. So when you get it, read it, mark it up, and come with very specific questions if you don't understand the task. But um, don't come to me lazily not having read the instructions properly and just tell me to repeat what I've already written, okay? So focus questions, you will get my devoted attention. So enjoy the day. 
uh, and uh, see you perhaps next Wednesday, certainly next Thursday. And you'll see me with the videos when they get up. And sorry for delay. Thank you.